Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Oh, Welcome back. George, thank you. It's absolutely brilliant to be back speaking and sharing this information with you and your listeners. Thank you very much. How does it feel to finally have this all put together in in one form? Yeah, a relief. <laughs> uh, an absolutely relief, George. It's been a massive task because I've, I've made the film. I'm not just the one individual. There's a group of us, but I'm the sort of principal person that's doing all the research and reaching out to the witnesses. So... That's correct, but Les Drake has done a lot of the filming with me, so we've co-produced this. And uh, I think, basically, the witness is, is the star of everything. I, you know, I confront this and, and talk about these accounts and some of the things and what I believe is happening in these areas. But ultimately, without these amazing witnesses who I, and on heart, believe are telling me the truth, they have seen and experienced something totally off the scale of what we would consider normal. And uh, without them, there's nothing. Wolflands took three years in the making, and I know COVID got in the way, so it slowed us down a little bit. But I think basically it's took that long simply because it's just been myself and, and Les Drake beavering away at this and chipping away and getting it all done, you know, making the props, getting into all these locations, actually spending, you know, nights and days in the location, sometimes with the witnesses. But, you know, George... It's not just cryptid related. Uh, you know, I, I know there'll be some researchers that won't agree with that. And, you know, I'm not going to argue because uh, that's their belief. But I believe this is multi phenomena research and everything within this genre, this full spectrum of the unexplained that we're looking into is linked. And I think the locations and I think the, the things that happen around the cryptid sightings, around the UFO sightings, in some instances, missing people but i find that one quite a delicate subject to talk about because of the well the sensitive nature it's someone's loved one but in some instances these locations we've got people going missing as well i covered those in the first book but wolfland yes it's cryptid you know it's in a ratio i would say 75 percent cryptid related but we do show the ufo element the light form phenomena which i've termed the ilfs the intelligent light forms and the, all the associated ingredients that go with unexplained phenomena, you know, what some people have tried to not deliberately bring new words in or new terminology, but this strange silence that envelops a person or a group of people when they're in the midst, the midst of a true unexplained event. And I've called it the lower silence. And often this, this is present. And whether it's the phenomena impressing itself on the individuals or whether it's just the fact that this strange phenomena is in the area somehow entered our sphere of existence i really don't know george but it's very complex and it, i would never want to be labeled as a cryptid researcher more multi-phenomena we shouldn't pigeonhole ourselves into one box i don't feel you know it's oh. there's lots and lots of things happening yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, this is across the board. There's a lot of high strangeness of different kinds there. Um, let's start with the conversation. We have sort of talked about it before, but for those who haven't uh, heard you previously on Coast to Coast, can you give me an idea about how far back the weirdness goes in this particular area and why you think that place instead of some other place? Well, I believe there's probably, the, there are many other places around the, the United Kingdom, around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it just takes dedicated research and someone who's willing to devote the time. I mean, you know yourself, George, with what you're involved in. This is a tw it's twenty four seven, and that's pretty much what it's like for me. It really doesn't stop. So it goes back. Uh, the, the first hint that there was something strange as regard the cryptid research was when I wrote the first book, and a newspaper put an article in saying I was wanting stories of the strange and unusual, and 
I got reports from a little village quite close to where I live, about 11 miles away, called Flixton. And when you look into the history of Flixton, it turns out that it's one of the earliest settlements in the UK where hunter-gatherers finally settled around a lake that is now called Lake Flixton. It's dried up now, it's a lake bed. But the archaeologists speculated that these people were shaman, practicing ritualistic magic and sacrifice. So... Added to that, throughout the decades, over well over hundreds of years, there are reports in archives of something that's come to be known as, well, we've called it the Flixton Werewolf, obviously named after the village. And, you know, you can go back to the 1930s, and I've co collected reports. And plus, I've got lots of first-hand accounts. And one of them, the Wolflands, the documentary, starts with a first-hand account from the village of Flixton, where this young lady driving home with her husband and children sees something on a roundabout. I mean, as she's driving down the road with her husband, a huge dog, for want of a better word, but we're talking about the size of a small pony. It frightened her to death. And what's interesting, George, is this roundabout, and I'm, to paint the picture, people will perhaps have to Google these locations. There's only one road into Flixton and one road out. It's a little village in North Yorkshire. But very close to the roundabout, within 50 yards, is a farmhouse. And it's, it's built on the ruins of a refuge that was built in, I think it was 937 AD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a thousand and... 85, 86 years ago, George. But interestingly, the refuge was built to protect travellers from an infestation of... from wolves, firstly, and an infestation of savage beasts. And the writing, the ancient text goes, least they be devoured. Now, back in the day, wolves would have been prevalent. That's, that goes without saying. Bears would have been extinct. They would have gone 1,500 to 2,000 years prior to 937 AD. So what was the infestation of savage beasts? And these stories, they've just rolled on. They've, they've rolled through folklore, because 11 miles away, as I've just said, George, I'm sat on the edge of the East Yorkshire coast. I'm literally 200 yards from the sea. Now, along this coastline in, in folklore, you've got stories of phantom hounds with huge glowing eyes almost we're talking bioluminescence and what a lot of people in in other parts of the world when they talk about seeing these creatures and there's no light thrown on them and somehow their eyes can illuminate well we've got these stories going back into folklore huge glowing red eyes and amber eyes and they go all the way up the eastern north yorkshire coast there's there's, there's, there's no end to the reports so what is Paul Sinclair doing? What am I doing? I'm, I don't think I'm breaking new ground, George. I think I'm treading in the footsteps of people from the past who've, who've documented, who've understood that something strange is happening. And I'm just talking about it in different terminology and reviving some of these things from the past because what was there is still here. And it, I think it shines through with these incredible witnesses that we've got who who've stepped forward as the door opens. It's just like with the, the congressional hearings, uh, which were absolutely fabulous, and you know tons more about this than me, but you've got men putting it on the line, what they've seen, what they've been told, what they've experienced. And it's opening the door. It's opening the door to, to show the world that true and unexplained, unexplained phenomena is out there and is real. The cryptid phenomena may be a decade behind what's what's coming uh, as regarding the UAPs, the UFOs, as, as in the, the abduction phenomena will follow after the UAP opens up a little bit more. I mean, you may disagree, you may not, but I think the cryptids are still a way behind. I think it's probably the most difficult to, of all the genres that we're looking into in unexplained phenomena for people to deal with and people to accept. And I can understand that. You know, the saying, seeing is believing, is very true. And for someone who's not seen anything like this, it's a, it's a big thing to get your head round. But I think by putting these, these witnesses, these first-class witnesses, into the documentary and just letting them open their hearts and, and lay it on the line what they've seen, in some instances very emotionally, uh, it's, it, it's not only allowing other people who are sat in silence, but it's allowing the, the populace to hear and think, you know, there might be some credibility to this. There may be something, just something to this. And we just throw it out there, George, and hope 
it lands and is, it gets a favorable ear. Yeah, well, a- absolutely. The witnesses are, are the heart and soul of your film. And uh, I can imagine it's not easy to get people to go on camera and tell these stories because, you know, they have to live here. Uh, people think they're crazy. Werewolves. Come on. You know, uh, it, it must have been hard in some cases, right? Absolutely. Uh, very difficult. And that's why I appreciate it. And I got a bit of a, a few kind of relief moments after the film was placed on the on on Amazon and uh, from a few of the witnesses, one I'd not heard from from in 18 months. And he contacted me just a few days later and said how pleased he was with it. And he'd been nervous about its release because he didn't know whether I were going to put him across in a favorable light, because let's face it, I've been invited and I've done a few bits in documentaries myself in the past, and they don't always finish how you Think you're not always portrayed, should I say, in how you think you are going to be portrayed. And sometimes, when you've been as serious as anything, the the editing can turn it into and throw a slightly different light on it. And I didn't want to do that. For me, the witness is paramount, and I've got to treat them with respect and show them in the best light possible. These are these are everyday people who hold down good jobs. They've got good careers. They've they've, they've got families and a life a life outside of this incredibly strange and often terrifying encounter that they've had. So I agreed with you, George. I mean, the last thing they want to do is carry this around with them for the rest of their lives, for people knowing that they've been involved in a project like this. But I've got a, a quite a lot of trust from the people that I deal with because I just want to put it over in the most truthful light possible. We did have a few people within the film who contributed early doors or sent us information but we, we, we just didn't use. We weren't disrespectful to them or, or anything, but the stories were dubious, to say the least, so we didn't use them. I mean, and since making Wolflands, you know, we've got a running tit- working title of Wolflands 2. It won't finish at that, I'm pretty sure. But we've got even more people come forward. By just Obviously, it's been a long project, like we said, three years, so we've been putting little bits out. I guess you thought... At one point, George, I'm not putting words in your mouth. Will they ever finish this? <laughs> and I could imagine that that's what a lot of people thought because I had no idea of the magnitude of what we'd taken on. And I don't know, 12 months into it, I thought we'd be done in six months. And obviously we weren't. So, yeah, witness is paramount and getting the trust of the people to come forward is difficult. But uh, I think we've, for the most part, we've we've managed it in this film. Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's it's terrific. I I, I want to talk about the area again, how far this goes back. And you do some digging. Uh, there's a guy named a writer named Alistair Lavers who who writes about ancient shaman, ritualistic sacrifice, shapeshifters, things of that sort. Tell us uh, who he is and what you learn from him. Alistair Lavers is a, as you say, a historian, a writer, and researcher of, of occult practice as well. A very interesting guy, and he, he lives in the area. He's, he's, he's wrote a number of books himself. I think they're called The Witcher Keys. And he he speculates, as does Mark Olley, the archaeologist. I don't know whether you've had him on coast. Uh, he's wrote about the crystal skulls and things. Um, Mark actually worked and excavated at Flixton Star Car, where all of these artefacts and where the story began for me, as has... Halister Lavers and spent lots of time down there that, as I said earlier, the people of Flixton Starkar were shaman practicing ritualistic magic and sacrifice. That's based on the artifacts that have been found and the knowledge that the archaeologists can gather. Obviously, we're, we're going back to the Mesolithic period. We're off back eight, eight to 12,000 years ago, so there's no way with any certainty that, we, that the, these people can be sure, but, you know, it, what's left behind does paint a picture, even if that picture is not sharp and as accurate as modern-day accounts. So Alistair's looked into this, and he he firmly believes that these shamanistic people could have been practising the magic and the sacrifice, as does uh, Mark Olley, the archaeologist. So present time, the qualified people are saying what I'm saying also, and the ancient texts. All are revealing that something highly unusual was happening in these areas. Even the place names, George. When you get oh, into yeah. the forest, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you get into the forests of North Yorkshire and people think about the United Kingdom, a postage stamp sized little bit of rock in the middle of the, the ocean, and you think, well, there's nothing there. It's not like the vast expanses of the United States of America and Canada and Alaska. And, and that is correct. But the, these forests where I've been doing this research, they form 525 square miles of forest, moor and, and coast. And it's not all unpopulated. Obviously, you've got roads running through it and you've got small towns and farmsteads. But for the most part, these forests are relatively untouched. And, and they're ancient, right? They're old. Some of them are very ancient. Some of them have been planted up. And there's, there's bipedal creatures that have been seen in these forests that are 50 to 100 years old. Uh, you know, because the Forestry Commission maintain these lands and there's a lot of rocky outcrops and scars on the land, you know, rocks and what what are called rigs. That's a an outcrop of rock, but they're not just little bits of rock. They, they, they kind of extend for miles. So, yeah, it, all the ingredients are there. I mean, we, one of the forests where th three men went wild camping back in, I believe it was 2018, and they weren't familiar with the area. They just wanted to go wild camping and just enjoy a, a weekend outdoors in this ravine, it's called Broxa Forest. So if you look into uh, ancient sort of mythology, in some cultures, the Broxa is a shape-shifting demon. So I find it it's fascinating. So you've, here, here you are in the UK, and somebody's named a forest Broxa. What an unusual name. And literally, I don't know, uh, a mile away from Broxa Forest, probably not even that. You've got a a, a, an ancient woodland and a, a moor, I think it's about 600 foot above sea level, called Silfo Moor. And back in 1954, I may be wrong with the date, but I'm pretty... November, November 1954, there was a story came out. It hit the newspapers here in the UK called the Silfo Saucer. Paul Sinclair, I know what you mean when you talk about the stigma that comes attached with the ideas of werewolves. Uh, people will say, oh, that's just something that Hollywood made up, when in fact, uh, werewolves, werecats, shapeshifters, things of that sort, that those have been reported throughout human civilization, throughout human history, pretty much everywhere. I mean, the oldest petroglyph in the world shows a shapeshifter. And as you document in your film, Wolflands, the idea of shapeshifters in that particular area, East Yorkshire, has been around as long as people have been there, right? It's very concentrated there. It, it really is. You know, when you start peeling back the layers, George, and you realize that this, do we call it a phenomena? This, it's real. It's very real. And it's been here all of the time. And it's come through the generations and come through over hundreds of years. It seems to resurface. And like I touched on earlier, is it is that just because you've got someone in the area a little bit more interested, stroke dedicated? I don't know. I, if we go back 100 and, over 120 years in a tiny village in North Yorkshire, and there's not a lot separating, separating east and north, you know. I mean, I'm only probably 12 miles from the border of North Yorkshire, not even that. But there was a, a writer and researcher called Howard Brearley, and I found it in an old archive uh, whilst looking through old documents uh, in, in, in the Bridlington Library. And Howard really wrote about what he called the Barguest, a huge fur-covered hound with huge glowing red eyes that frequented, that haunted the, the forests and moors of North Yorkshire. And... What's interesting, he lived in East Aiton, and I touched on this, the forest of Hackness. So, apologies, I touched on the forest of Broxer earlier, and in between Broxer and, and East Aiton, you've got Hackness, which is the heart of the Forge Valley. And when you, when you go into Hackness, it, it's literally four miles from East Aiton. So this man, 120 years ago, is talking about this He's obviously got some knowledge of it, and there's probably ancient texts and those, there's, I don't know, maybe oral stories that have gone to the grave with people way back then, but he had knowledge of it back then, the Barguest of East Aiton, and it's literally four miles from the, the, the entrance to the Forge Valley, which is Hackness. Incidentally, Hackness 
um, used to be called Hachanos, which means with the whiskers. Quite where that fits into everything, George, I don't know, but it's an interesting name. Well, the other one is Humnaby, this little settlement, Humnaby. What does that mean? It's translated into... Yeah, it's Hund, meaning hound, Hund. So you'll find a lot of people in eastern North Yorkshire, they've they've got their own dialect, so they'll say a, a Hund. And, but it actually means a hound or a dog. So you've got hund man. So you've got hound man. So when you put them together, b b hund man b is a village. Incidentally, it's two miles from Flixton, which is the place where we talk about the Flixton werewolf. And there's nothing in between hund man b and Flixton. There's just barren land. There's woodland and and open land. The wolds, which in ancient text means the wilds. So you've got hund man b. Hundman, George, which literally means farmstead of the houndman. <laughs> now, that's, yeah, I've not created this to fit it in nicely into the documentary Wolfland. The, these ingredients are already there for me. And, and it's so fascinating because in between Flixton and Hundman, farmstead of the houndman, you've got a hill that you branch off from Flixton and go up this hill, and it's called Whitegate Hill. The amount of reports that I've got from Whitegate Hill is, is uncanny of an upright bipedal creature that's jumped into the road in front of two ladies driving home. They haven't gone on film. I've, I've, I've got their story, and we, we do hope to get them in the next documentary. Uh, obviously, they're driving. They've not been drinking. It's took them by surprise. It, they're going down Whitegate Hill towards Flixton, and this thing jumps into the road, and they saw it for a split second. I don't think these things are, are by chance, George. You've got all that open countryside. You've got all that woodland, yet suddenly something jumps in front of somebody's car and then springs off. She said everything looked... Or they said, apologies there, they said everything looked wrong about this, yet it moved so fast. Uh, it was very lean as well, I'm told. There's another story... And I've called this the Twig Man, and it came from October twenty sixth, October, October the twenty sixth, twenty twenty two. And once again, we've got a guy who's driving from a nearby village called Muston. And once again, we're only three miles from Flixton, two miles from Hummumby. Muston used to be called Moonstone. There was a large stone there many, many years ago. But he's driving there in the night. I think he said the time was just before nine p.m about 50 miles an hour, and he said, he, 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 in his peripheral vision, he caught so, a glimpse of something, stood at the side of the road, and as he approached it, it immediately set off running and was keeping up with the car, which is not possible at 50 miles an hour, 50, 50 to 60, I think is what he said. He said he's fiddling with the full beam, and he put the full beam on his car, and caught a glimpse of this thing, which he thought, when he saw it in his peripheral, it was, he thought it was covered in twigs. He thought it was just a huge, upright, bipedal whatever. He doesn't know what, how to describe it. Covered in twigs. Now he believes it was matted hair. He said it kept up with his car for about 10 seconds. He said, I'm still messing with the lights and shocked by what I've seen. And it just diverted and just ran away in, into the, onto what's called Flixton Star Car. But once again, the ancient lake bed where the people from the Mesolithic times are said to have practiced shamanistic magic and sacrifice. So all the ingredients are there. Everything seems to be linked. And, you know, I'm not bending these stories, George, to fit a narrative. They, it, it, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's perfect. It's like it's just fitted together. Hunt man be like you said. It's yeah. just, it's, it's, I find it fascinating. There's one of the stories that you come back to uh, through the film. Uh, you go camping with these guys who had had an experience. You go back to the location. It's down in this ravine. It's almost pretty claustrophobic. They were down there. There's no way they could really get out in a hurry. But what did they see down there that just scared the bejesus out of them? Well, yeah, th th these are the guys that pr planned their wild camp. They do it two or three times a year. There was three of them. Only two would go on film. And they contacted me, George. I mean, obviously, I would not know these stories unless people had. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Mo but momentarily, when, this, when Steve first contacted me, and he'll not mind me saying this, he broke down in tears. He was he, he'd nobody to speak to apart from Jim, who'd witnessed it with him. And, and as he says in Wolflands, he'd not even told his wife. 
And they they drove from a place called Rotherham, which would be about 130 miles away, and they drove to a place uh, and parked up at a place called Reesty Bank, which, in essence, the word Reesty means rancid and, and, and disgusting place. But there's nothing smelly about it. it. Why it's called that, I don't know. And then from there, they went on foot into the forest of Broxer and descended into a ravine. It's a seven to 800-foot ravine. We've spent time down in there, as you said, and when they went in that night... They went in quite late and they didn't know the correct route. So in some places they had to go down on the bottoms because it was so steep. There's actually another path where it's very steep, but you can still make access without doing that. Now, witness number three, as we'll call him, who hasn't gone on film. This is the interesting part for me, this, the more paranormal aspect to it. When they got down there and started setting up camp, because these guys weren't interested in unexplained phenomena. All they wanted to do, they were, again, the River Derwent, which runs in the bottom of this ravine. Uh, all they wanted to do was just relax and have an, an incredible weekend, these three guys together just in the wilds. And witness number three said, I don't like it. We've got to go. There's something watching us. Now, as Steve said, he said, it was getting dark. We'd already struggled to get down there, and there was no way we were getting up in the night. And he's getting more and more nervous. So to the point where he's, they think he's going to go on his own. He said, and then all of a sudden, he's, the witness number three said, look over there. And in the darkness, a huge pair of amber eyes lit up. These eyes just glowing in the darkness. As Jim said, he said, no torch on them. The firelight wasn't illuminating them. And I went back on my own, you know. Well, I went back with a friend and we measured it. It was 42 feet away. I took a surveyor's tape and because I'd already camped in the area with these guys. I knew exactly where it appeared and where they were sat. And in the end, Jim and Steve were so concerned that their friend were going to go running off into the darkness that Jim stood up and walked towards this Whatever it was, he said, it was about three foot off the ground. But He said, but the eyes were huge, as big as his fists, and human-shaped, and, and amber. He said, and I couldn't think of an animal to assign these eyes to. Those were his exact words. He said, so I stood up, made a few hissing and shooing sounds, and it, it disappeared. So I turned back round to the guys, to my friends, and suddenly their jaws, they dropped. He said, and I realised something was wrong. He said, so when I turned back, he said, I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. He says, from being three foot off the ground, these eyes were now seven foot in the air, and I could see the outline of this, what they said was a werewolf, as crazy as that might sound for people. And, you know, George, it's not just that. Steve said, if you'd have asked me to draw that, a werewolf, sketch it, I wouldn't have drawn that. He said, it was ridiculous. He said everything about it looked ridiculous. He said you could see these monstrous shoulders. He said and every so often it would turn to the right and they could see this muzzle that w w looked exaggerated, so long. And, he, and, and Steve admits, and I'm not, you know, I don't mind using the names because these guys have been happy enough to go on film and what they've said, what I'm saying now is nothing that they've not said on film. He said he watched us all night. He said... In the end, he said, I, I wanted it to be over and I wasn't bothered how it ended. It was so frightening. He said, I couldn't even look at it, yet I could still see the glowing eyes in my peripheral. And he said, it was absolutely terrifying and daylight started to seep through and it had gone. But had it gone? Because their friend said, it's still here. Mm. It's still here. And as they're packing the things up and walking out of the forest as, as hastily as they can, he's still telling them it's there. And then they got to a certain point in the forest, he says, we're all right now, it's gone. And there's another element to that, George, that I didn't add. During the night when it was watching them, when they're all huddled together and, and frightened, witness number three said, it doesn't want you here, it wants mm. you to go. So that implies to me, and, and Jimmy and Steve hadn't picked up on it, and, all the, and I know we'll never know, because I don't think they've spoken to him about it, it's troubled him so much, that this thing somehow was communicating with him. He says, it doesn't want you to be, it, do, it wants you to go, Jim. He says, he, he said in Yorkshire dialect, and V, which means and you, and V, Steve, it wants you to go, it don't want you here. So how did he perceive that? How did he know that that, creature, whatever it was, was watching him. 
there's definitely some element that takes these things over and above your standard flesh and blood, bone and skin animal for me. And I've, I know not everybody's going to agree, but that's the way I look at it, George. I, I'm going to play a little clip, uh, one clip that you provided to us uh, from the film. It's, it's one of the witnesses. You can tell us a little bit, fill in some details on the other side of it, but we're going to play that now, Michael. So as I'm settling down, I hear a noise over to the left. It's a good distance away, 20, 30 metres away. I've heard this noise in the brush. It sounds like an animal, but it sounded like a relatively big, something decent size. Yeah. Then I've become aware that the, uh, the atmosphere has changed. Sort of, I can't hear the waves anymore. I can't really hear any, uh, any wind. Insect noise has pretty much gone. It's just still. It's like someone's pressed pause. Then all of a sudden I get an anxiety that's sort of starting to come over me. I'm looking over to the direction where the noise has come from originally and I can hear something in that area, but it's coming towards me. It's, uh, I, c- I can hear a bubble of sort of footsteps, but I couldn't pick any footsteps out. Heavy, real heavy footsteps? Really heavy. But it, it was the atmosphere that came with it. It was like it was like a train was charging at me or a group of racehorses. Something was coming towards me. I need to stress here, you don't come up in these areas and experience anything like this usually, do you? No, never before. Like I've, I've sat here all night long, not heard anything, not been bothered, not been nervous about anything. It's it's dark up here, but that doesn't worry me at all. It's, it's strange that something would bother me, but it was almost like the anxiety in me just switched on from where I can't tell you. Proper fear. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. Paul, you've heard that description from multiple witnesses that you interview for this film as somehow this these creatures tap into the brain, into the flight or fight uh, response, and, and the fear is exaggerated and immediate, right? That's correct. He, as he says, he, he went from zero to ten. It, it's kind of in an instant. And anybody who watches the film and sees this guy, Gaz, as that's his first name, uh, will we'll realise that he's, he's quite a formidable-looking guy, a really nice man as well, to be honest with you, but uh, he'd gone up to a place called Scalby Mills, which is on the edge of the North Sea, and he'd gone to, to try and film and get photographs of the Northern Lights. And it's a remote place, quite remote on this cliff top, and it, this is one of the instances where... Th- he didn't actually see anything, but he, he, he this this terror impressed itself upon him. And as he says, he first of all he could hear movement in the brush a distance away, and he, he sort of felt focused on that. And then he can hear heavy footsteps, bipedal footsteps coming towards him. What the if if we'd have played a little bit more of that, George, it would it would have said that it, when when the fear hit him, this wave of fear. And he said it was almost as though someone had pressed pause. I loved his analogy. He said because the sound of the sea, the sound of the seabirds, and, and anybody who's lived near the coast uh, who's listening to this will know that the seabirds don't switch off in the night. They've, mm. uh, they've got better eyes than owls, to be honest, George. They're absolutely amazing flying everywhere. And uh, he said, but everything stopped, like someone had pressed pause. And he, he could feel this pressure in the air and this thing coming towards him. And he said, I dropped into the fetal position. And I expected to get whacked, was his exact words. He expected to get something was going to hit him. And as soon as he felt like it was upon him, everything just snapped back to normal. And this, the experience, it was as if it had never happened. Yeah, this guy is a big, like... tough-looking guy. And he says, I felt like I was a five-year-old kid. I was absolutely terrified. Paul Sinclair, I imagine it's one thing to be sitting at home in a well-lit room, listening to this and saying, ah, oh, there's no such thing as werewolves or wolfmen or dogmen, anything like that. It's another thing to be out there in the dark forest at night by yourself in the situations that you document in your film. There was a, a case that you have of a guy, a mountain biker. You'd already told us the story about somebody who was driving out there and this thing came up on side and ran with the car for a while. This guy's biking. He's on a bike and something huge and invisible starts running alongside him. Tell us that story. Yeah, that's correct. This guy's called Sam, and he'd gone on a 28-mile uh, mountain bike ride, George, across the moors, and uh, on. And he ended up coming home. He said he'd left it a little bit late, <clears throat> and uh, he ended up entering the forest or the, the, the heavily wooded area of what's called Langdale End, 
quite late. He said it was dark. He said all that you could see was the, the chalk road in front of him. Uh, no fear, because he'd never experienced anything like this before. As most of the witnesses, they've not gone looking for this. In fact, everybody in Wolflands, the, the phenomena has come to them. So he's familiar with what's out there, as in deer and fox and badger, because that's about the only thing that you're going to encounter in the forests of the United Kingdom and the woodlands. Riding along, it's dark, as I've said, and suddenly something burst out of the woodland, on his, I think he said on his left-hand side, and startled him, obviously, and it's heavy, and it's cr crushing and crashing through the undergrowth at the side of him, and he's looking to his left. He keeps looking, keeps looking, and can't see what this is. He can hear it, and it's very close. And as he says in, in the documentary, I'm familiar with deer and how they react, and they sort of zigzag about, and they don't parallel somebody on a on a woodland path or a forest path he said and I'm, I'm i'm getting more and more anxious i speed up and whatever this is speeds up with me i, I don't know the exact time span but in the end he, he screams and swears at whatever it is that's pacing him in the forest and it instantly stops doesn't divert divert and go into the forest whatever it does it stops on a dime it's just stopped he carries on cycling reaches his car he's got a bike rack on the back of the car and he's just in blind panic he said he dropped his keys at one point he's just that frightened looking behind him gets the feeling that whatever it is is still watching him and uh, obviously gets his bike on his car and speeds away into the night but interestingly george langdale end it's in the middle of nowhere. It's, once again, the Forge Valley, very close to all these other locations. Hackness, uh, Broxa Forest, Howard Dale, where we've got reports, and where the gamekeeper had his report was about seven miles away. But interestingly, I, I spoke to a rock angler, of all things, because the coast is not far away. It's only about six or seven miles away as the crow flies. Not even that, probably, in some areas, as it, the land weaves in and out. But he put me in touch with a guy who lived down Langdale End because he told this rock angler while they were fishing one day, he believed that there was a bear, of all things, that had been reported in, in the ravine at Langdale End. And it's, it's common knowledge that walkers, over years, I don't mean like every week, I mean over a period of years, have stopped tractors, ran over to people in fields and said, we've just seen a large animal, we think it was a bear. Now... What's interesting also is that Langdale End leads to that ravine where those three guys got trapped in the night in 2018. So once again, George, location is key. Isn't there some kind of burial mounds or something there? I think you interviewed this guy next to this main burial mound. Who's buried out there? How old is that? These, these are mostly Neolithic earthworks, and yeah, that's correct. I mean, we've, I'll jump to those, what you're on about, but we've got another report that's never been talked about near, near in a nearby forest, and that's near burial mounds called the Three Tremblers. Nobody seems to be able to decipher why it's called, the, these mounds are called that. But jumping back to that one, yes, they're very close to burial mounds and, uh, and, and earthworks, and you've got... Uh, what's called Wolf How, which uh, the How is a burial mound or a, a tumuli. You've got uh, Wolf How Low, Wolf How High. Just, I suppose these are the elevations of these things. But interestingly, very close to where he had his encounter with this thing that paced him, you've got a place called Moor Rig. Now, I established earlier, if anybody picked up on it, that a rig is an outcrop of stone, a, a rocky area. But what I found fascinating was the word moor, because it's not just spelt M-O-R-E, it's spelt M-A-R, as in the moor. And it, it kind of it has connotations and signifies Norse. There's a, there's a huge Norse presence, and when we go to the Norse presence, we've, we think of Fenrir, the Viking hound that was said to have brought about the end of the world in the Viking, what well, well, would have been, but essentially the Viking Bible, Ragnarok, where Fenrir brought about the yeah. end of the world. Yeah, that, that wolf is the son of Loki, I think, right? That, that, that's correct. So we've got this place there called Moor Rig. The moor is the gaping jaws of a beast, an animal. And we've got Wolf Howe very close to it. And <clears throat> there's, there's, there's another area, probably about half a mile away from Moor Rig, called 
War's man's head. Now, in Norse, the, the Viking terminology, the warg is a wolf. The, yeah, that's right out of uh, Lord of the Rings. That's Tolkien stuff, yeah. warg, right? Yeah, so, and, 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 you know, Tolkien obviously didn't create these names. He, he'd done his research and realized that the warg, in going back much, much further than Tolkien, is, is a wolf when we're talking about Viking terminology. So we've only got to swap one letter and War's Man's Head becomes Wolf Man's Head. Wow. Which is, <laughs> I, I, we know they're only plays on words, George, but it's fascinating. There's so many clues there. And, you know, yeah, War's Man's Head, more rig. Everything, the brocks of forest, all the ingredients for the strangeness seem to be present in these areas. I, I want to touch on a real serious harm that has, uh, that has erupted in that area, uh, animal mutilations. And then you take it a step further to look at people that have disappeared and possible human mutilations. Is it related to these creatures, these seven foot tall wolf people? It, it would be It would be wrong of me to say, yes, they are, uh, but... It, equally so, I think they've got to be included in in these accounts because th- these things have happened in the locations that and are very cl- close proximity to where the documentary with has been made. Just like, and we'll jump to what you've spoke about in a moment, George. Just like the missing people of Bempton, which is pr- my main area of research, you know. It would be wrong of me to say that they've gone missing and some they're somehow involved in some kind of UFO uh, encounter or alien abduction encounter because I've no proof of that. I've, but I've documented in the in the first truth proof book because they've gone missing in highly unusual circumstances in an area where things of a highly unusual nature take place. So yeah, we've got Langdale Forest, which is very close to Broxer, very cro- close to all these other areas. And back in the 1990s, there was a researcher, I'm not sure if you ever got the chance to speak to him, George, you may have done, called Tony Dodd. He was a, a retired sure. police... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I did a bit of work with Tony on a on a lightning that crashed off the north, off Bempton, actually, at lightning XS894 on September the 8th, 1970. I found lots of new information about that that Tony didn't know. Uh, and we, we worked together on that. But jumping to this, Tony was researching back in the mid to late 1990s, Dalby Forest, where he was looking into reports of strange creatures, strange animals that had been seen. Uh, the the chup, Chupracabra, I think I pronounced that right, of a Georgian uh, yes. and, yeah. and other things. Animal mutilations. Uh, I think they'd found donkeys, they'd found fox, badger, sheep. Nothing any different to what I've been finding in 2017 to 2019, on and around the cliff tops of Bempton, but more importantly and more macabre was the fact that Tony documented bodies that were found in a certain field in Dolby Forest. Uh, you know, because there are clearings, there are meadows, and the authorities, so I'm informed, told the general public at large that these were mannequins, shop mannequins that had been oh. placed in the field. <laughs> Over a period, yeah, I know, they were finding one at a time. I mean, who's going to, for my money, who's going to take a shop mannequin deep into a forest and leave it in a field for somebody to find? So that's what Tony was documenting. And what's interesting, if this is true, and I also need to add that I've got more information on this, that It'll, it, it'll probably be something for another documentary, but we've identified the field. I have, I have the name of the field. I've also been told that this area now has to be closed off to the public occasionally. And uh, I don't mean like they close it off with some tape. The, all access is, is uh, stopped to the public because these, are, these forests are more. You can, you, know, you can walk about them. And obviously, not many people stray off the forestry paths because it's they're very deep. But I've, uh, I've, I've just got this recently got this new information which i will be chasing up on but and i do i don't find any any what's the word any excitement in talking about missing people and uh, because it's not entertainment george it's very serious in, in my eyes because it's someone's loved one it's someone's son husband wife or whatever but i don't think we'd be doing these cases justice if we didn't document them i think we've just got to be careful that we don't place them or attach them to any part of the phenomena because we've no proof of that. I think all we can say is these things have happened in areas where things have 
other things of eye strangeness take place. So interestingly, Tony's working in these forests and he's, he's working with a witness who he calls Cedar. Now, we think we've identified Cedar now, and we're going back to the 1990s, early 2000s. Cedar may not be with us anymore, let's face it. But And I think through the gamekeeper who appears in Wolfland, we've identified Cedar. But what a shame, George, because I know the listeners to, to your show won't know the, the, the extent of the gamekeeper's encounter, but he, he was working in the forest around an area called Stape and Cropton, which are seven miles away from where I've just been speaking about, with nothing in between, it's just forest. These places are only separated by names and forest tracks and roads that run through them. And he had no idea, when he had his experience in that forest in Stape, walking back to that abandoned farmhouse, he had no idea at the time that there was an active researcher in Tony Dodd working with people within the neighbouring forest looking at strange creatures, uh, animal and, as sad as it is to say, human mutilation. So everything was linked. I mean, back in the day, I'm sure that the gamekeeper would have loved to have spoken to him, although he did sit on his encounter. I don't know when he contacted me. I think he contacted me in 2019, and he'd sat on it from 2002. He'd just not spoken about it. And with this guy, it's not a matter of he didn't feel brave enough. This guy is a formidable man. He just, I think, as with anything within the subject of the unexplained, if it's impacted a person, if you've had, you've been touched by the abduction phenomena, the only proof you've got of it is ingrained inside your head. If you've seen the cryptid, the only proof you've got is what what you've actually digested, what you've taken in through your eyes and your senses. And to try and tell somebody uh, who's never had that never had that experience and then risk being laughed at, it's it's a deeply it's a hurtful thing and it's an insulting thing to the individuals that had the experience. And like we've said earlier, and I think lots of people would agree, seeing is believing, but these people have seen things that's off the scale of normal and it's such a difficult thing. They've got to be threatened with respect. Well, I totally agree with you, and I've been through that same situation. The witnesses that I've interviewed about Skinwalker, the Uinta Basin, Skinwalker Ranch, in and around that area, who've seen what we'd call werewolves and other kinds of creatures that don't make any sense that are not found in the geologic record that shouldn't exist yet. They see them over and over and it's dozens and dozens of people have seen them um, and they get scoffed at, they get ridiculed if they come forward and say it. So most of the witnesses in all likelihood never tell anyone outside their immediate family about these things. It's like that for you and your witnesses. It's exactly the same. And you know, you touched on the, the name on skinwalker and, there's, there's places all around the world, I don't mean there's hundreds of them, that, that are, are similar and, and exhibiting this this high strangeness. And I think Bempton and the, some of these forests are no different, and you've got the Hoyabaku forest that, that so to see, seems to exhibit high strangeness and missing people. Uh, I noted that you'd, you'd got some playing some music by a mutual friend, Robbie, yeah. earlier. And yes. I, I've, spoke, I've spoke to Robbie. I've been fortunate to spend time in his company, and I spoke to Robbie about these things, and he's fascinated. He's absolutely enthralled by this, and I sent him some footage the other day that I'd cleaned up of lights under the sea off Bempton. You know, I know I'm jumping away from the cryptid, so I do apologise, George, but I spend an unhealthy amount of time in these locations, and I was up there just just before midnight on the 15th, so it's not long ago, and uh, with a psionics camera, I spend a fortune on cameras, a lot more than what the psionics cost, but that's able to pick up things in low light. So with the with our eyes, we could see the lights under the sea, myself, a guy called Ian and Peter, and we filmed, or I filmed these lights. I put a bit of grainy footage onto the internet uh, without cleaning it up, and I just put about 10 seconds, but I've since taken it into a program and cleaned four minutes up which it's incredible. We've got lights beneath the surface of the sea. I mean, I don't know what that's telling us. Uh, are, we, are we looking at a true USO? And I like to be honest about these things, and I'm sorry for branching away here, George. No, no, I was going, I was heading to Bempton Cliffs. That's where I was headed next, so good. Okay, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I want to be as truthful as I can. These were true unidentifieds, but I'll just jump back a few months. I have a thermal camera, a Pulsar thermal camera, which is very good. And I was scanning the, the sea, 
there'd been a vessel out there called an unmanned research vessel uh, called the X-20, and I'd been documenting it for months. I don't know what it's doing out there. It's about 15 to 20 foot long, and it must be remotely operated. It's got side scan sonar. It's got all sorts of things on it. And I knew, the, I saw from the light configuration of this vessel, because I'd been watching it for so long, that it was out there. And when I'm scanning with the, with the thermal camera, I can see a huge heat signature alongside of this vessel. And I'm, I'm quite excited, I'll be honest with you, because it's, it's clearly below the surface. And the, if the vessel's 15 to 20 foot long, this is something like 40 to 50 foot. It's a long, glowing tube. And... I thought, good God, I've, I've actually fi I'm filming a true USO beneath the surface of the North Sea. Well, a week later on South Beach in Bridlington, a 45-foot spur, uh, sorry, fin whale beached. Oh. It was one of two, and yeah, yeah, so I could have sat on the footage, George. This is what I'm getting at. I could have sat on the footage and put it out there and not and told a little untruth and said, you know, look, look, look what I filmed. Look at this amazing bit of footage <laughs> of a true one. But I told the truth. I believe I'd filmed the whale. I think that's exactly what I'd filmed. And I went down onto the beach and actually filmed the whale as well uh, on the beach, this, this unfortunate uh, animal. Hey, you're, you're an honest guy, Paul Sinclair. You, you tell the truth. You tell it to the best of your ability. So I imagine, based on the treatment, the the uh, honorable treatment that you give the witnesses who appear on camera in Wolflands, the first one, it makes it so much easier, hopefully, to produce a follow-up, Wolflands 2, whatever you want to call it, that uh, people will see you treated them with respect and they can trust you and it would be easier to get them to appear on camera and tell their stories. You would hope so, George, yeah. I mean, it goes without saying that the, the people that we've filmed, uh, I haven't had a negative response from anyone and they're, they're quite happy with with what they've seen in the finished product. So hopefully we've opened the door, just like with anything else, just like these incredible congressional hearings that you attended, which benchmark kind of moment, you know, that's opening the door for the phenomena to become more acceptable to the population as a whole. So let's hope that by producing films and or documentaries like Wolfland, it helps people feel confident enough to, to share these accounts because a lot of things, that I think, George, are getting taken to the grave with people, accounts that are absolutely incredible and not just cryptid-related across the full spectrum of unexplained phenomena. Let's take a call. We've got Ryan in Pearl River, New York, on the Wild Card Line. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to Coast to Coast. What's on your mind? Gentlemen, awesome show, awesome guest. Okay, this reminds me of a great movie with Abbott and Costello, Me Frankenstein, and Luke <laughs> Costello gets off one of the greatest lines ever in the history of Hollywood. Lon Chaney Jr. tells Luke Costello, listen, you got to lock me in my hotel room tonight by 12 o'clock. And Costello is looking at him, inquisitive, like he's like, "Well, why?" He goes, because "Lon Janey Jr. tells him because at twelve o'clock I'm going to turn into a werewolf." And Costello tells him, "Yeah, you and a million other guys." Now, <laughs> guys, I love this. I'm fascinated by it. I know a lot of people have gone camping. I've gone done a lot of camping in my life since I was a kid. Every werewolf story I ever hear, or have seen a werewolf, or potentially they saw a werewolf. Couldn't be sure because of the bush and everything. Always in the woods. Now, always out in the area camping. I wonder if werewolves have a preference. The thing is, if you really want to get the, the really low down of werewolves, especially in North America, especially up in the where there's big wooded areas in this country in America, they have to repeal the 65 Immigration Act. If they repeal that act, finally you'll have people in Congress that will be looking to solve some of these mysteries like werewolves. And hmm. we just won't watch them in movies, very popular with Lon Chaney Jr., like I said, in that movie. <laughs> Thank I've you, seen Ryan. And, yeah, yeah for, you, for your amusing and interesting question. And, you know, j just to briefly touch on a few things, obviously you'll probably know this, Ryan, but there's no correlation to phases of the moon or silver bullets with what we're talking about, that's purely reserved for the movies and, and in, in, I don't know, creative writers. Uh, you know, what we're dealing with is something that's been here a hell of a long time. And I also need to say that 
the, the, the documentary does not just cover the werewolf, even though it's titled Wolflands, because primarily that's what we have covered, but the gamekeeper's encounter, it could have been almost Bigfoot, Sasquatch type related. We, I guess we'll never know. But yeah, thank you. Uh, you also have a, a case where one of these things is seen down by the ocean, right? It's on a cliff. It's not in the woods. From the film? Yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's correct. And I'm, what's interesting about this is the other associated phenomena that's, that's seen with these things. I think you're, uh, you're talking about um, the guy who went for a walk along, he, he lived in a small fishing town called Reeton, right on the edge of the coast, and further up, n- aptly named, is Speeton. And these are where the 400-foot t- cliffs emerge, and he took his dog down onto the cliffs, down onto the beach, and they, so these cliffs slowly s- sort of changed in gradient till they become 400 foot, and these are to part called Black Cliff. Incidentally, it's where there's been a lot of big cat sightings as well. And I think everybody in the UK now and around the world, you know, for years we've resisted the idea that these big cats could be here. But I think it's people know that they're here. But it's just interesting that that's the spot as well. And he described his dog as being quite intuitive, as in it it, it was a pointer dog, a gun dog, and it would stand in a different stance if it saw a rabbit to what it would if it saw a pheasant. And he can't work out what it's looking at. And... He gets his binoculars from his breast pocket. But incidentally, I've just talked about the full moon. There was a full moon, and I don't think that's got any kind of relation, but it's just that's what he told me. Full moon in November 2019, I believe it was. And he said, I, I looked up at the side of the cliff, and there's something I believe was a big goat or a donkey. I couldn't tell what it was at first. And then it stood on two legs. He said, it's looking at me. I can see it's silhouetted, no glowing eyes, nothing, no gnashing teeth. It's just a dark silhouette. He said it turned and went along the cliff tops. What I find fascinating about that account, George, is the fact that when I looked up the, the full moon in November 2019, I believe it was November the 12th, two days prior to that, and we'd no knowledge of this story that I've just related, I was on the cliff tops with a filming, not filming, apologies, we filmed it for Wolflands, but I was on the cliff tops on the 14th of November 2019 with a guy called Lee Haywood. Yes. And Lee, yeah. Lee's a bit of a skeptic, and he'd come down to explain to me or try and solve what I'd been looking at when we killed these lights, the intelligent light forms. He believed there would be a rational explanation. And it was, you know, and it, we saw the lights, and we saw a huge sphere of light in the field with us. Now, obviously, I didn't know about the, the cryptid story till well after that. But when, when we marry them together, we realize that there's two days between sightings. And the account that I was told by, by this man of, of what he saw, I wasn't alone. He told there was a guy with me, a witness called Bob Brown. He heard the story. And then on a later date, there was a lady with us called Amanda Eames. And Amanda, myself and Bob, I asked him to tell the story to Amanda as well. You know, and... Just strange, uncanny that we've got light form phenomena and we've got strange bipedal cryptid type creature seen within the same location, within the same proximity and within the same time span. Not the same night, but 14th of November, 12th of November. There's not a lot of difference. You have a case in your film. I had made a note about it. That's why I remember two people named Jamie and Lee. They're walking along. They see this huge animal in the darkness it's sitting on the edge of this cliff. They didn't know what it was until it moved. They had an ominous feeling. It was a big black shadow. Then it stood up. It looked like a really big dog. They had these equipment, an, an IR camera that they were out there to take some photos. They could see this thing with their eyes, but not on the camera. And uh, and when it, it sat down, they figured it might have been six or seven feet tall. It looked massive, right? They, they said it was incredible. They'd gone down into the, this ravine, uh, at Flamborough Head, it's the peninsula, the headland, about four miles from where I'm sat now in Bridlington. During the night, they'd, came, they'd come for a weekend and they'd got a cottage in Flamborough and they'd walk down to Flamborough Head, the headland, which is pretty remote. It gets tourists there in the daytime. It's a beautiful place, you know, stunning scenery. They stood at the top looking out to sea and entered the ravine, <clears throat> which would be about 70 foot deep, I would think. Earth steps down into it and a little bridge with running water at the bottom. Quirky coincidence, it's called Holmes's Gut. That's what the locals call the, the ravine. And this lady's surname was Holmes. <laughs> Just a 
coincidence, people. I don't know why I'm rambling on about that, but there you go. So when they're down in the ravine, they note that some geese are flying over the head and they could hear the geese. And then suddenly, just like the guy on the cliff tops at Scalby Mills, which would be about 10 miles away, suddenly everything went silent. She said it felt uneasy, we felt frightened, and she said she'd sort of tapped Lee in the chest and said, come on, we can do this in daylight, we're not familiar with the area, this don't feel right. And they, they climbed the steps, and they stood on the top momentarily, and then on one of the nabs, as they call them, the outcrops of rock, looking down into the, the, the cove, which would be North Landing Cove, they can see something sat on the very edge of the cliff. And they'd looked there before, and they said they couldn't, they, they sure they'd not seen it, but obviously they're not looking for unexplained phenomena as in a cryptid, and they, they, they're puzzled. You know, they could be wrong. It could be just a statue or, or, some, or a big rock that they'd just missed. And they're watching it, and Lee's got a, an assortment of cameras, and he put the IR camera on it, as you've just said, George, and they couldn't see it through the camera. Then Lee said it growled. Jamie didn't hear it, you know, and he heard a grumbling sound or a growl, and this thing slowly lowered down then from being what she estimated to be seven, seven foot, sat in this position. Huge dogs, she said, huge ex exaggerated long arms that she can see uh, in its silhouette, and it slinked along the edge of the cliff. And they, obviously, after seeing this, they disappeared down down onto the main road and back to their cottage. And they must have done some Googling that exact night, that same night, and I was still up. I'm, I don't get much sleep, George. I'll go to bed at 12 and I'll wake up at 5. That's a regular thing for me. And they contacted me. I got an email and they told me what they'd just seen. And I met them the very next morning, with once again, with Bob Brown. And they allowed us to film them uh, uh, on the clifftops. Jamie came back then at a later date with one of her excuse me, with one of her relatives, and I filmed Jamie separately, and that's what's in the film Wolfland, yeah. that interview. I got one more thing to raise with you. When you and I okay. first started uh, communicating uh, years ago, it was about weird lights, the Bempton lights, uh, the mysterious lights that you had documented. You go out with this guy, this skeptic guy that you mentioned, for this film, and he's going to explain away these lights, and you to see something really dramatic that is recreated in this film, this huge ball of light that is on this side of a hill, uh, pretty spectacular sighting. Absolutely, George, and I've gone up there for years and years and said, as I've said, I'll make it as quick as I can. I've got this unhealthy time that I spend up there, and Lee had come up to look, and it's almost like these things performed on cue. A bit, and I often say that your unexplained phenomena does not perform to order, but look, we were driving along this single track road. Lee says to me, what do these lights look like? Literally looked out the window, there's a huge orange sphere of light in the sky. I said, like that. He didn't say at the time, but he said, I realised I, I, I didn't quite know what I was looking at there. He would it knew exactly what military aircraft should have been in the sky. He could tell you the names of the boats out at sea. So over the period then, George, of about, I don't know, Three or four hours, we documented these lights out at sea, and I've got a camera, a Sony NX80, aimed at aimed at these things, trying to film them. And they oh. just appear, they just punch into existence. But I turned round to look at Lee, speak to him, and there's a huge sphere of light, and in Lee's words, the influence that the light gave off was as big as a Volkswagen Beetle, and it's in the field with us. And as I'm pulling the camera around, it's imploding and dissipating, and it's gone. And that I saw it with my own eyes. That's the most spectacular thing I've ever seen up there. Yeah. That was with Lee Haywood. That's a pretty awesome incident. It's a, an awesome incident from a really great film, Wolflands. You can check it out on Amazon, folks. I highly recommend it. Paul Sinclair, always a pleasure to speak to you. I can't wait to hear what you're working on next. You're welcome here anytime. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure. Time. 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 Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.